When people hear about hip replacement, they usually picture a metal ball in a cup. But what it's made of, the actual materials, has a huge impact on how long it lasts and how your body reacts to it over time. Today, I wanna to talk you through the story of hip replacement materials, where we started, what went wrong, and why the implants we use today are now better than ever. I'm Dr. Tyler Goldberg, an orthopedic surgeon specializing in concierge hip and knee replacement. For the last 25 years and 12,000 surgeries, I've seen patients literally transform physically and mentally. I'm on a mission to transform the way the world experiences joint replacement. Ready? Let's hit it. The early days, cement and cement disease. Modern hip replacement really took off in the 1960s and 1970s. Sir John Charlie is the founder of modern hip replacement. Little known fact, my father actually got to meet him at a conference. I wish I could have met him too myself. I would have told him that his work influenced my life and gave me my passion project forever. Back then, the standard setup was a metal ball and a stem that fit down the inside of the thigh bone, a plastic cup in the pelvis made from a material called polyethylene and bone cement in between, which acted like a grout to hold everything in place. For a while, these worked amazingly well. For many patients, it was life-changing, but as we followed people longer, especially young Younger, more active patients, we started seeing a pattern. Years down the road, some hips would loosen. On x-rays, we'd see bone loss around the components. This got labeled cement disease. The idea was the cement itself was somehow toxic or causing the bone to disappear. Later, as we dug deeper, we realized it wasn't the real story. What was actually happening was wear of the polyethylene, the plastic. Every time you walk, that metal ball slides against the plastic cup. Over millions of steps, tiny plastic particles get shaved off. Your immune system sees that debris and reacts. Over time, that reaction can cause osteolysis, or areas where the bone is eaten away, and eventually the implant loosens. So it wasn't really cement disease. It was a particle problem, a wear problem, coming mostly from the plastic. Once we understood that, the focus shifted. How do we make the plastic better so it wears less? That question led to one of the biggest breakthroughs in hip replacement, highly crossed polyethylene. Around the late 1990s or early 2000s, manufacturers started using a process called cross-linking, basically using radiation to heat and lock the plastic molecules together more tightly. What did that do? It made plastic much more resistant to wear. Studies now with 15 to 20 years of follow-up show dramatically lower wear rates and very few revisions due to polyethylene wear compared to the old liners. In practical terms for patients, the wear problem that used to limit the lifespan of hips has been pushed down to almost negligible levels in typical use. Nothing in medicine is truly zero, but cross-link polyethylene took wear from a major long-term issue to something that we rarely see in modern hips done well. What we use today, the modern standard construct. So what does a modern total hip look like, especially here in the United States? For most of my patients, the setup is a titanium cup that's press fit into the pelvis. It usually has a porous coating that lets your bone grow into it. Inside that cup is a cross-linked polyethylene liner. That's the advanced plastic we just talked about. A ceramic ball on the femoral side, a hard, very smooth, and extremely wear-resistant ball. And a titanium stem that grows inside of the thigh bone, most often uncemented, again designed so the bone can grow into it. We call that combination ceramic on polyethylene with a titanium shell and stem and it's become the most common bearing choice in hip replacement in the United States. Why do I like that setup? Very low wear from a ceramic on cross-link polyethylene interface, excellent biocompatibility from titanium, and a long track record in very large patient groups with a very high patient survivorship at upwards of over 20 years and beyond. It gives us durability without some of the unique risks that came with more exotic material combinations, other bearing surfaces, pros and cons. Another combination you may hear about is ceramic on ceramic, a ceramic ball on a ceramic liner. The big upside of that, it has incredibly low wear. On a lab bench, it's about as close as we can get to no wear. But there are trade-offs. Squeaking. Some ceramic on ceramic hips can make an audible squeak with certain movements. Studies put it in the low single digit percentages overall, but it's real enough that patients should be counseled about it. 
And if they have it, it's extremely dramatic. How about number two, catastrophic fracture. This is rare, but it can happen even with newer ceramics. A ceramic component can theoretically crack or fracture, which usually means a revision surgery and careful management of hard fragments. Because crosslink polyethylene has gotten so good, and because of the squeak and fracture concerns, ceramic on ceramic use in the US has become more selective rather than routine. So while ceramic on ceramic can be a good option in specific cases, for most people, I take the tiny bump and wear from ceramic on poly in exchange for fewer weird complications like squeaking. The other big story, and frankly, the cautionary tale, is metal on metal heads. These use a metal ball and on a metal socket, often with large heads to improve stability and range of motion. Early on, the idea was attractive. Very low wear on paper, great stability. But over time, we learned the downside. As metal surfaces rub together, they release metal ions like cobalt and chromium. In some patients, that triggered a strong tissue reaction. Things like pseudotumors, which are soft tissue masses, inflammation, pain, and damaging the surrounding soft tissue and bone. Certain large head metal on metal designs ended up with high failure rates, and several of them were formally recalled around 2010. Today, we essentially don't use large head metal on metal in routine total hip replacement. If you have one of those older implants, we monitor blood metal ions and image closely every couple of years because some patients may need to be revised. What this means for you as a patient. So why does this matter to you if you're just trying to get out of pain and move again? It's because the materials tell you a lot about how long your hip can last and what kinds of problems you're trying to avoid. With modern combinations like ceramic on cross-link polyethylene with titanium shell and stem that I routinely use, we've dramatically reduced the wear and particle issues that plagued earlier generations. No implant is perfect and no material is magic, but right now we're in the best era we've ever had for hip replacement materials. We're combining decades of lessons learned from cement disease area to polyethylene wear problems to metal on metal experience and we're folding all of that into choices we can make for your hip. When you come see me, we don't just pick a hip off the shelf. We choose materials that fit your age, activity level, bone quality, and timeline. And we choose them with the long game in mind. So when you hear ceramic on poly or ceramic cross-linked polyethylene, that's not just jargon, that's the story of how hip replacement got safer, more durable, and more predictable over time. If you're considering a hip and knee replacement and want to understand exactly what's going into your body and why, that's the kind of conversation we'll have together. Want more on hip and knee replacement, recovery costs, and real patient stories? Check out the playlist below. If you're trying to figure out your own next step, start with the joint quiz and contact page in the description. That's the best way to get connected with my team. If this helped, Please like, share, and subscribe for more straight answers about hip and knee surgery.